Just tell me when you're ready. No, no, it's okay. I thought she was Deborah. Oh, okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. This is the sixth of six panels we've done on socialist solutions to pressing problems. And a big problem today is what's been going on in Puerto Rico particularly in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And we have a panel of people. I'm mostly here today. I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green Party candidate for governor. I'm here mostly to learn. Uh, but I do want to say a few things, because I was up in Buffalo and talked with uh, people in the Puerto Rican community there. And they were talking about what we need to do to help the people in Puerto Rico. And what they talked about was eliminating the control board, which has taken control of this Puerto Rico's budget out of the hands of the people they've elected, canceling the debt, the predatory lenders are bleeding Puerto Rico dry, demanding federal funding to rebuild Puerto Rico, and to rebuild it on a solarized basis. What they're doing is rebuilding fossil fuel plants once you build solar infrastructure, the sun shines, you don't have to pay for the fuel. So that would be better for the people of Puerto Rico. So those four demands, I think, are things uh, all of us can agree upon. And one of the things we want to talk about tonight is what we can do about it. Now, I'm running against Governor Cuomo, who has taken a couple trips down to Puerto Rico and distributed a little aid. But my position is we need more than charity, we need change. And Cuomo has a platform and a megaphone where he could go after Wall Street, which is bleeding Puerto Rico dry with this financial control board and the massive debt. And so in terms of socialist solutions, we need to demand change, not charity. And that's all I'm going to say about Puerto Rico. And I want to hear what our distinguished panel has to say tonight. And I'm going to introduce them all. And then they're going to, we'll just go from left to right or right to left if you're on the other side. Uh, to my immediate right, your left watching, is Daniel Vila. He's a member of the Green Party and co-host of La Voz Latina at WBAI. And pardon my Spanish, but I'm not good at it. Uh, next in line to Daniel's right is Aisha Rodriguez. She's a school teacher in the public schools here, a member of the United Federation of Teachers, and she runs Bronx Educators United for Justice. And on the far left for you in the uh, audience is Dr. Caliris Sales Ramirez, who is an assistant medical professor at the CUNY School of Medicine. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel Vila. <clears throat> Okay, and how much uh, do I have? Five hours? Uh, six hours? Uh, let's, let's try to limit to 10 minutes for the first round, and then we'll get into it with question and answer. Good enough. Uh, yeah, okay, my name is Daniel Vila, and I was born in Puerto Rico, uh, mostly raised up in New York City, and uh, have lived about almost half my life in New York City and half uh, in Puerto Rico. I, besides being co-host of uh, La Voz Latina, which has been on WBAI on Mondays at 10 p.m. for some 15 years almost, uh, I'm also labor coordinator of labor affairs in uh, Queens, an organization, community organization called Sisa Pacari Cultural and Labor Center. And uh, we have several thousand members out there, and I hope people are able to, to pass by and visit us uh, between 67 and 68th Street on Roosevelt Avenue. And uh, cutting to the chase in terms of the, the situation in Puerto Rico, uh, I'm just going to point out basically two, two main elements. Uh, the first one, uh, I think that most people that are at least in, in this room present, and probably many, or if not most of the ones that are listening, are aware that Puerto Rico is a colony. It is a U.S. colony invaded by the U.S. in 1898. They also invaded uh, Cuba, and they also invaded Guam and the Philippines the same uh, year. And the excuse was that they were freeing us, liberating us from uh, the domination of Spain, from Spanish colonialism. Today in Puerto Rico, all the major organizations, 
all the major organizations recognize that Puerto Rico is a uh, political party, that it is a colony. For example, uh, we have the uh, situation that uh, even the governor of Puerto Rico right now, that is the uh, pro-statehood governor of Puerto Rico, recognizes that Puerto Rico is a colony. And they, uh, his party, uh, sort of like the Republican Party pro-statehood here, uh, and the other ruling party in Puerto Rico, which is sort of like the Democratic Party, to give an analogy, they also realize and recognize the uh, popular Democratic Party, which is not very popular, not very democratic, but in any case, they, they realize that Puerto Rico is also a colony. So it's, it's almost a mute point today in Puerto Rico to say that it, it is a colony. Everybody, even the pro stateholders, uh, agree that it is a colony. The problem in Puerto Rico is how do you uh, get rid of uh, the fact that it is a colony? How do you uh, uh, reach another status? And, and that's where uh, many of us uh, that are really uh, in, against imperialism, I feel, are the ones that uh, support independence for Puerto Rico. And it should be clear, I believe, that independence for Puerto Rico is not going to be brought about by electoral means. Uh, the elections are a tool, just like we're in the Green Party. I'm also, I happen to be uh, chair of the Manhattan Greens here in New York City, and that's where most of my focus is here in New York City, where I have uh, my feet planted. And, and most of my political work and so on, uh, community work, is done in, in relation to, to affairs here in, in New York City. However, when we're talking about Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico must be liberated by Puerto Ricans, and it will not be done through the, uh, the electoral uh, process. It's going to be done by some type of a mass, if it is done, uh, and I believe that it can be done, uh, through some type of mass uprising, given certain elements which just drive people batty and say we can't work within this colonial uh, straitjacket anymore and we want independence. We are possibly reaching that point after uh, so many years, over 100 years of US colonialism with uh, the imposition of what is called the Fiscal Control Board. The Fiscal Control Board uh, is the result of a law called PROMESA, uh, and that law was signed into, uh, into effect not by uh, El Trompudo, not by the guy in the White House now, but the nice guy uh, who was in the White House before, right? The guy who deported over three million and a half immigrants and uh, who said nothing whenever black people or, or anybody, white people or, or Latinos were being killed by cops on the street, never said anything unless, of course, there were you know mass demonstrations and sometimes maybe riots, and then he would say some nice words against uh, or in favor of uh, the victims. But uh, that nice guy signed this horrible law called PROMESA. It has imposed a fiscal control board which dominates everything in Puerto Rico. They have more power than the governor, more power than the legislature, and more power than the, uh, the municipalities or the courts in Puerto Rico. So that is the the focus which many of us feel in Puerto Rico we could use to mobilize uh, a good majority of the people towards independence, uh, making people realize that as long as we are a U.S. colony, this fiscal board and any other board, even if it disappears that the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, decides to impose on us, is the reality, is the fact, is the, the uh, dictator which will rule our lives. I'm going to pretty much leave it there. I have some more concrete elements to bring out to you, hopefully at another, at another point in a, in a few minutes. Uh, there is a, a call, uh, and I was just in contact with the person by phone yesterday. There is a call being made for a historic march in Puerto Rico. They call it the Mega Marcha. Uh, the plans are to match, march from the west coast of Puerto Rico, from Mayaguez to San Juan. It's a march which should take one week. Uh, and there's going to be a continued marching from Ponce, which is on the eastern part of Puerto Rico. That march should take one week. The idea is for thousands of people to converge in San Juan on the 18th of November. It is a march being, uh, one of the main leaders is a man called Ramon Nenadic, who is a former president of a university uh, of Puerto Rico uh, union and also used to head the Labor Department there. And, but he, in, 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 in coalition with some 60 organizations, are calling for this march. And we will talk about this march, which may be key in terms of uh, trying to break the control of the Fiscal Control Board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so my name is Aixa Rodriguez. I run Bronx Educators United for Justice, which for now is just a Facebook group, but that allows me to mobilize people and get people informed without anybody telling me what to do, which is great. Um, we, me and Calirisa and uh, Mercedes um, Martinez of Federación de Magistros de Puerto Rico and Edwin uh, Morales-Leboy, also from FMPR, were just recently in Indianapolis. Um, 
my job as a, a teacher is to make sure that my kids are happy and learning, are engaged and love where they're at and are feeling hopeful because I'm an ESL teacher. I'm the first teacher that immigrant and migrant students meet. I'm the one who helps them learn the language. And post Maria, and but prior to Maria as well, but post Maria, there was a flood of students that came all over New York State. And what people on the ground are talking about is the absolute lack of preparedness that schools had who were receiving these kids. Cultural incompetence, linguistic incompetence, and because of the state of the schools in Puerto Rico, a lot of kids, like happened in my school, came without important documents, um, the struggle to, to see who had um, IEPs, who had special needs, who needed to have um, their transcripts evaluated, lots of challenges and hurdles for these kids. And because we, in New York City in particular, are not doing the best job with bilingual programs, transition bilingual programs, or dual language programs, we don't have enough and they're not highest quality, um, a lot of these kids are facing obstacles that they shouldn't have to face. Um, and because the situation in Puerto Rico has not resolved itself as quickly as um, people assumed it would, like, oh, everything's gonna go back to normal, we still have a lot of these kids still in the city and still around New York State. And because of poverty and other issues, um, rebuilding issues, et cetera, the constant closure of, of schools, there's another 300 that are being closed? Yeah. Well, so? she denies that now. Oh, good Lord. This one, um, so, <laughs> Enemy number one for me <laughs> has become Julia Kelleher, who is the de uh, Secretary of Education, Department of Education in Puerto Rico, because she has literally done things that have gutted the system there, which results in many Puerto Rican students coming to where they have family and anchors, still is New York, but also Florida, also Chicago, other places, and she has created a domino effect in all of our schools. Now, we're not prepared to host these kids who are now suffering from trauma, who are homeless and displaced, creating situations where extreme levels of stress, sleeping on sofas, um, some of them were in hotels and being displaced by FEMA and all kinds of craziness. Um, it all impacts our schools and it all impacts the future of Puerto Rico. I was born in New York City. My parents were not. Um, they were born and, and raised back and forth in a circular migration going back and forth and back and forth. So our identity is a very mixed identity, but these kids are coming here and being treated so horribly that they're not even able to develop a full sense of dual identity or even love for this country. This is the experience that they're having. It's very negative and it's, it's very toxic. And the levels of stress and the level of anxiety is preventing them from learning. And uh, I'm very concerned about the future because if you keep closing schools, displacing kids, and making class sizes larger, and um, putting kids in in uh, trailers to learn um, instead of using totally okay buildings to teach from, and teachers are in an exodus. Lots of people are leaving and still leaving, and they can't find enough teachers to teach the courses. There's a lot of problems happening in the schools in Puerto Rico, including violence, including push back towards teachers and the stress is to the point where lots of kids have missed a lot of school, missed a lot of education, and there is going to be a permanent impact for that generation, and I'm concerned about that. Hi. So I was actually born, raised, and educated in Puerto Rico. Um, and I have a long history of educators in my family, starting from my grandmother being a um, cafeteria lady, um, moving on to my c cousin being a special ed teacher, my aunt being a Spanish teacher and then a counselor in the schools. And both my parents were professors or at the University of Puerto Rico, which is a whole nother ball game as well. Um, the idea of privatizing education in Puerto Rico has been long standing. Um, and so we have to definitely give a shout out to La Federación de Maestros de Puerto Rico, along with the PIP, El Partido Independentista de Puerto Rico, um, because they've really taken a stance on protecting public education at both the primary, secondary, and higher education level in Puerto Rico. Um, our government seems to, the first thing they want to get rid of is schools and the, the public university system in order to privatize those services for, for our people. And of course you take away education and you're taking away people's rights. 
Um, so fast forward post Maria, um, our current governor, Ricardo Rosselló, uh, who is a legacy kid, his father, Pedro Rosselló, was also the governor of Puerto Rico several years back, and he was actually the one that initiated this cascade of events of where Puerto Rico has come to this place where it is in this fiscal debt crisis, um, which ultimately resulted in the fiscal control board that is now depriving our communities of having any sort of access. So part of being a colony is not just the fact that we're marginalized and oppressed and continue to be colonized in every possible way, but we also have the opportunity to get more money if, 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 if the government decided to. More relief, more health care, more exceptions. But of course, when you have an island full of black and brown folks, um, we, and, 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 a, and an island that has 45% of the population living below the land in poverty, who the hell cares? Let's just take over the land and start developing. In terms of education, we have the Secretary of Education, which is Julie Keller, who is also <laughs> my arch nemesis, um, that has come and closed a total of 442 schools in two years. Um, and so in turn, 40% of the public schools in Puerto Rico have been shut down, and they have been given to the highest bidder. So it's not that these school buildings are being given back to the community so the community can do something to revitalize the real estate, themselves. Right. Um, it's who wants it and, and, and who gets it. And religious institutions have gone as far as getting these buildings for a dollar. Um, so we're not serving the community in any way. Um, their main interest is that the students in Puerto Rico become fully Americanized. Um, the, one of the first expenses was six, $17 million spent on a values curriculum. Um, so whereas here, those of us that are educators advocate for culturally responsive practices to support the whole child, um, Julia Keller has come in to impose her rhetoric along with Betsy DeVos's rhetoric that the money follows the child and not be placed in the school in order to support resources for all children as well as provide um, the teachers with the right. So of course, she hires some psychologists to support these school communities while at the same time imparting the trauma of taking away their second home or the place where they could potentially get some resources in order to support their own community. I went to visit schools in Puerto Rico right after the hurricane where students had full access to a farm and agriculture where they would feed their whole communities. Those schools didn't have roof. Um, in their buildings. These kids were just harvesting food for their community. Those schools were closed down within the next six months. Um, so it's happening and it's happening relatively quickly. This past week there was an announcement that the government was trying to shut down another 300 schools for next year. Both the governor and the Secretary of Education have denied that from happening. But at the same time, last week Aitza and I at the Network of Public Education also were faced with a news report saying that the NAACP had supported statehood for Puerto Rico mm -hmm. at, while the president of the NAACP denied that. However, they have, not, they have yet to retract that statement. Yeah. We're, we're um, waiting for that. We're, we're, we're waiting Jerry, for that, yes. Derek Johnson, the president of the NAACP, promised us, yes. because it was very uncomfortable, I think, for him to recognize that there were people in the audience at NAACP, and PE was supposed to be a friendly place, calling him out on his organization's in position, I'm sorry, of imperialist attitude. Yes. Because that's exactly what it is. And, and the hypocrisy of being for self-determination of South Africa, yet you have Puerto Rico right here, and you think that you have the opportunity and the chance to, so and the right to say, hey, why don't you become a state? It's none of your business. Do you even have a, a chapter over there? No. He does not. Did you recognize that we're black there too? No. <laughs> Did you recognize all the stuff that you fight for social justice? There? No. So why would you possibly have, and, and his organization have any right to say anything about self-determination on the island at all? And the idea that they are having votes at their meetings, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, either you're with us or you're against us. And it was very lovely how he was like, it was fake news. Yeah. Etc. The video's there. If y'all want to find it at the Network for Public Education, Derek claimed that it was fake news, that they were for self determination, blah, 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 blah. We're still waiting for that op ed that he promised.
I will add that the university, so the public university system, La Universidad de Puerto Rico, has Under 11 attack. campuses across the island. Um, the fiscal con last year, um, the students uh, did a strike and they closed down so each campus days. for 72 days to fight against the increase in their tuition. However, starting this fall, the Fiscal Control Board imposed doubling their tuition, um, which they, they did in effect. In addition, the University of Puerto Rico has lots of benefits. So if you are on the honor roll, you get a reduced tuition. If you're an athlete, you get a reduced tuition. Um, there are lots of different ways that students are supported in the island. Statistically, Puerto Rico, per square mile, has more educated people than anywhere else in America. Recognize that. Um, and so taking away that access is now limiting access to, again, this island that is composed of 45% of people living below the line of poverty. So you're taking away their jobs, you're taking away their livelihood, their stability, etc. These 11 campuses run independently. Um, however, now with the Fiscal Control Board, we're going to have another increase in tuition. We're taking away all of these benefits for all of these students. In addition now, the campuses will also be run by hubs. So those 11 campuses will now consolidate, just like they consolidate public schools. Um, and the campus in Rio Piedra will be in charge of Carolina and Bayamón. The campus in Calle will be in charge of Ponce and Macao. And the campus in Mayagüez will be in charge of Aguadilla, Utuado, and Arecibo. We in distance, that the map is necessary to understand how ridiculous In that's distance, all. we're talking about campuses that are hundreds, <laughs> that, are, that are tens of miles away from each other, over mountains. So if a student needs a transcript, so if you need to talk to a professor, so if there's somebody in the administration that you need access to in order to do anything, Lord. you it will take days for you to be able to access them because you still have an island that still isn't fully on the grid. You still have an island that where the internet can go away um, for a day or two. You have mountains. Um, you have mountains. And, you, and you have a system that doesn't have a public transportation system where things are accessible to students um, or to our population. Um, Ricardo Rosselló has been very focused on ensuring that we get sold to the highest bidder. So every single article that the government has put out is around how the tourism has been revitalized. It's not about how the people have come together to be able to revitalize the island of Puerto Rico. Governor Cuomo has done a good job in making sure that his hedge funders and his corporate interests are very much manifested in Puerto Rico as well. So he's taken, he takes a private plane from his hedge funders, they go and visit Puerto Rico and let's see who's the highest bidder to get some land and develop a hotel or potentially develop some of these charter schools. Currently there's only one charter school that has been approved in Puerto Rico, it's from the Boys and Girls Club. However, there are 83 proposals because 83 charter schools will be brought in to privatize public education in Puerto Rico on the backs of black and brown children. Um, and so we can talk about that more. Um, but definitely we're in a state where we have the capacity as a government mm. to be able to assist and provide the relief for the people of Puerto Rico and build a Puerto Rico for, Puerto, for, for the people of Puerto Rico rather than whoever the 1% is yes. um, that wants to live on the, black, on the backs of these black and brown people. Okay, before we go into question and answer and discussion, uh, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? We have with us candidate for New York State Comptroller of the Green Party, Mark Dunley. You want to take a minute and just tell people who you are? I'm going to sit next to you, Howie, so I can get this thing over here. Okay. Um, so I'm Mark Dunley, and I'm the Green Party candidate for State Comptroller. But the main reason I wanted to say a few words was that my wife was the Region 2 uh, Environmental Protection Agency Administrator uh, for eight years, seven years under Obama. And that region includes Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And so she spent an enormous amount of time uh, down there, um, particularly there was one community, um, Cano Martin Pina. Uh, but basically, she's never been allowed to develop um, and now has half a million people living in it. 
and you know trying to get uh, the federal government to pay to dredge um, you know all, all, sort of all the drainage problems and unfortunately um, she also became an expert on hurricane relief because she was EPA administrator for Hurricane Sandy and had to fight Cuomo in particular. Uh, and even her own government, federal government FEMA, on the um, reclamation of um, New Jersey and New York afterwards. And so she was actually hired by uh, the Virgin Islands, government of Virgin Islands recently, to assist with the reclamation of the Virgin Islands. The Virgin Islands were hit before uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands were hit twice, so they got two hurricanes, whereas the second hurricane is the one that hit Puerto Rico. So she was already working in the Virgin Islands. So she's the expert, I'm not, but just a couple of things that I learned from you know being around her. Um, one is, is that our federal rules under FEMA um, basically requires you, if the go federal government Congress gives you money to rebuild, you got to rebuild what's already there. And so it meant that we had to go rebuild the fossil fuel infrastructure in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. And Puerto Rico pays twice as much for electricity as any other place in the United States because basically we get, we're important oil in order to burn to produce electricity. And her and other people fought really hard to use this money from the federal government to um, you know, rebuild renewable energy, um, clean renewable energy, and, and basically that was not allowed. She was able to eventually get, representing the Virgin Islands government, some changes in the congressional appropriations on, on the rebuilding to loosen the, the rules a bit. Um, the other rule, which I had never heard about before, was also the Jones Act. And basically, the Jones Act uh, requires any goods that are being shipped into Puerto Rico to be shipped by American ships. And that means that pretty much um, they pay double what any other island in the Caribbean is paying for a, a lot of basic goods. And then Virgin Islands is even worse because the Virgin Islands had to get everything, you know, via Puerto Rico. And when the Puerto Rican, you know, ports shut down after the hurricane, the Virgin Islands were particularly um, hit quite badly. Um, how we can talk a lot about corruption in New York State and the fact that um, 50 top-level state officials have been indicted or convicted since 2000. Corruption, unfortunately, is even much greater in Puerto Rico. Um, and that's really part of the colonial legacy, that it was basically a free-for-all for everybody to exploit. So it included both the outside come in and include the hedge funds. Um, but that's a real problem. Um, and it's a real problem with particularly the public utility in Puerto Rico, which is just rampant with corruption. And it was also part of the opposition to trying to rebuild renewable energy because the um, the public power system there um, was, in fact, um, you know, so corrupt. Puerto Rico, of course, has become you know, one of the symbols of the dangers of climate change. I mean, I just ask people, could you have survived for six months without electricity, as many families were forced to do in Puerto Rico? Could you have survived without access to drinking water for that period of time? And, you know, and that was you know, sort of our uh, future and the other thing, of course, with all hurricanes and all climate change, um, you know, you mentioned that uh, they talk about how the tourists, you know, they're they're dealing with the needs of the tourists, but not with the needs of the of the, you know, the average person. And all these, as we saw in um, um, New Orleans, as we're seeing in Houston. One of the things that happens after hurricanes, it allows the very rich and it allows the hotel to gobble up a lot of the best land. They basically displace a lot of the low-income communities, and when it's rebuilt, it gets rebuilt to benefit uh, the hotels and the tourist industry, and the, you know, the community people are, are very much um, you know, displaced. 
Puerto Rico has tremendous environmental problems. Um, I forgot to ask my wife this, but she even stunned the governor of Puerto Rico when she explained to them like 75% of the residents of Puerto Rico do not have operating sewer systems in their homes. I don't know if that's the exact percentage, but it was an incredibly high percentage. Uh, what, what percentage? That it has the most contaminated water. Like you can't okay. drink tap water. In right. And she got into a big fight with the Center for D Disease Control. In fact, they ended up stopping the plane on the uh, runway from, I think, LaGuardia, um, about the Zika virus, because basically they were going to go just spray the entire island with pesticides to try to deal with the Zika virus. And she was telling them, well, wait a moment, what percentage of the mosquitoes do you kill when you spray? Well, we kill about 5%. Well, 5%, you're gonna spray the entire island and you're gonna kill 5%? How many times are you gonna spray? Why don't you give money? No one in Puerto Rico or hardly anybody in Puerto Rico has any screens on their windows. You wanna keep the mosquitoes out, how about giving people screens? It would be a lot cheaper. And it's just that, and this was the Obama administration. This wasn't the Trump administration. Um, they, you know, they just don't understand it. And then the last one she asked me to, to do a little mention about was Vieques and you know the whole bomb in there and so one of the first things she did when she came over there you know 20 colonels and lieutenants and generals they all flew her over in these Black Hawk helicopters to Vieques to inspect the cleanup and she goes what are you doing um, and she actually went back to the Pentagon and met with the generals and she met with OSHA and she said, do you understand what they're doing in Puerto Rico? They are hiring teenagers for minimum wage and they're giving them like five hours of training and then they have one bunch of these kids out there with machetes and they're chopping away to try to find the unexploded ordinance. And then they put a flag next to that unexploded ordinance. And then they have another set of teenagers that come in, minimum wage, and they take the unexploded ordinance and they throw it into the back of trucks. You know, this is not, you know, sort of proper. Um, and then apparently, you know, they decided not to remove the ordinance that fell short of the land and is all out there you know, in the ocean. And you could just go on and on and on but I mean, part of the colonial legacy is that this, you know, Puerto Rico has been exploited for the interest of the wealthy and for, you know, American and, and foreign investors. And we just know how the present Congress and the Trump administration feels about the environment. Well, whatever is bad in the United States and the environment, it's much, much worse in Puerto Rico because it's not a political concern. So I'm not an expert in the least, but I wanted to share some of those things. Okay, thank you. So we're open for questions, comments. Try to keep them brief so that we can respond. Yes. I, I, I just heard a whole lot of things that are wrong with Puerto Rico, but I, I I'm really looking for the solutions, which was what this was supposed to be about, socialist solutions to the problems. We just heard many, many problems. Is there any solution to this? I think that That's what I'd like to hear. I think, yeah. So one of the things that has been pretty amazing about everything that's happened is that people are creating different grassroots organizations um, intellectuals are coming together. So there's a group of us scientists um, through, uh, throughout an organization called Ciencia Puerto Rico. Um, we're applying for federal funding and we're looking for supports in order to generate um, renewable fuel programs. Um, there's several faculty members from the University of Puerto Rico that were the ones that lit up the middle of the island using solar power. Um, Dr. Arturo Masol, who was actually one of my professors when I was in the University of Puerto Rico, he runs Casa Pueblo. 
um, and they were actually the hub for the south part of the island, taking care of those communities, providing solar power, providing food, etc. Interestingly enough, um, a month or two ago, he was arrested um, by the police in Puerto Rico, claiming that he was drunk after having some pizza and a Coke with his daughter. Um, and so the government looks for ways to continue to oppress and marginalize folks that are on the ground. And intimidate. Um, there are farmers that are also taking back land. Um, and so we are bound and restricted by the laws of the USDA for certain crops to grow in certain areas. Um, and so farmers are taking back lands um, and they're growing crops that will feed communities. So, so there's a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance and a lot of grassroots organizations that are organizing and reimagining what the island will be. Um, some colleagues of mine, high school, friends of mine from high school have also created different um, nonprofits. One of them is called Iser Caribe, and they're looking at um, the wildlife and fisheries and what sorts of fish and beaches, what can we do in order to preserve the fish and the, and the beaches in Puerto Rico. So I think there's a lot of, there is some brain drain. Um, there have been a large number of doctors that have left the island. However, there's been a recommitment um, within the island to help reestablish the economy and to push the government. Um, scientists are talking about, okay, how do we inform our legislators? How do we get in there and, and create policies? Our legislators, you know, they go with the <laughs> wherever the motion is going. So if there are intellectuals that are providing them with the literature that they need in order to push these policies, I think there's a lot of strength that's coming from the scientific community as well as grassroots organizations. Now how can we help that are watching this who can I go into that? How can we help um, the people watching this? How can we make a difference? Why don't you repeat the question? I'm not sure it'll come through. Yeah, I think the uh, question is how can people here in New York City and the United States help uh, in terms of solving uh, these problems in Puerto Rico or what we're talking about today, uh, socialist solutions for, for Puerto Rico? And I like that question very much. Why is it that Puerto Ricans uh, don't rebel? Over? That's not really the question. The question is, you know, why, why why doesn't something happen? In 1868 in Puerto Rico, there was a rebellion called the uh, Grito de Lares, right? It was the first rebellion uh, for independence. Um, this year, I think we commemorated the 150th anniversary of that rebellion. There was an uh, intellectual leader of that rebellion uh, called Ramon Emeterio Betances, who after he had uh, gone to France, uh, Otherwise, he would have been assassinated in Puerto Rico by the Spaniards. Uh, he, he desperately made a, a call before he died. He says, uh, why the, you know, more or less you could translate it into English, why the hell don't Puerto Ricans rebel, yes. right? And we still have that question. And I'm going to tell you something that people don't like on the left. Uh, if you go to Puerto Rico, I've been to Puerto Rico twice this year already. I went to Puerto Rico twice. Now, if you go to Puerto Rico and you walk around the streets, San Juan, and most any part of Puerto Rico, I have a house in Las Piedras, which is on the East Coast. You walk around Las Piedras or whatever, people don't feel offended. Are dressed better than we are dressed here, with the exception of how he looks nice. Uh, they dress. <laughs> They dress better than I do, and it's not because they have money, and it's not you know expensive clothes that I'm, that I'm talking about. It's just that people have a taste uh, differently than here in New York, where we dress down. We do it on purpose. We could dress better. We do, but people in Puerto Rico dress nice. And you look at the cars; all the cars are nice, shiny cars, right? I mean, you know, you could walk, take a trip tomorrow to Puerto Rico. You, Walk around, see the cars. You're not going to see old, you know, jalopies. Uh, you're not going to see cars with a lot of smoke coming out. Everything is like very well organized. And you go into the countryside and you see those nice, beautiful cement houses. You know, like 90% of the homes in Puerto Rico are cement, at least. Uh, most of those homes that you see pictures of that were destroyed were the wooden, the ones made of wood. But, you know, I have a house in Puerto Rico. Nothing happened to it. I have a whole bunch of friends who have uh, uh, cement houses. Most of them are, are okay. The problems are in rural areas, our infrastructure, and those wooden homes. Now, the reason why people don't rebel against American imperialism, unfortunately, and you ask them, they'll tell you, is that they feel that they are getting some, something out of this relationship. 
And, and, and it is true. And this is something that we on the left very often cannot understand and analyze, but people in Puerto Rico literally are not dying of hunger. I mean, you walk around Puerto Rico, you will not see all the homeless people that you see on Penn Station, 40th uh, Times Square, you know, uh, all over Manhattan. You see all, all this poverty and all these depressed people. I, I saw a guy on the train yesterday. I'd never seen anything like this. The guy had 13 bags. I even took a photo of it. He had like five cars of the train, five seats taken up for himself, sleeping on. You don't see that in Puerto Rico. I mean, I'm not saying that there's not hunger, there's not poverty. There is. There's more poverty than here. But that's, people live a little bit differently, and that's due to the fact that there is family. There is family. Uh, for example, why I have my house everybody in, in that neighborhood, in that barrio, uh, is my, the Villa family. And when, when he has problems, I help him. When I have problems, she helps me. And, and the children very often live with the parents up until they go to college or until the parents die or, or whatever. And, and these situations help to ameliorate the problem, make it uh, less stressful. And also, there's another big, big solution which people don't have in, in Honduras or in Guatemala or in Mexico. That is, we are American citizens uh, thanks to the fact that they imposed it on us in 1917 when they needed cannon fodder. They needed, they needed soldiers to go die and, and, and kill for the, the U.S. And so Puerto Ricans, uh, we were granted uh, that citizenship for that reason. Imposing. The other side of that blade, the other side is that about almost a million Puerto Ricans have left Puerto Rico over the last 10 years. So what? You have a situation where we could come to the United States, me including one of them, right? Uh, and, and people could send money back to Puerto Rico, just like they do in Mexico or other countries. And that's another big, big, big help that we don't analyze. So people in, in Puerto Rico, I have one friend, for example, she's my age, she's a grandmother, but she's got several children out here working and they send her help. It's not very much, but a little bit here, a little bit there, and then what she's able to do over there. So these are all things that add up to a situation where the, the people of Puerto Rico in a way feel that if they can survive with this situation right now, they're not gonna take a chance in becoming an independent. And they say, if we become independent, we're gonna be like Honduras, or we're gonna be like Mexico, or we're gonna be like Haiti, or we're gonna be like, like Venezuela. These are the, there's the propaganda. There's the propaganda, right? I've been to Cuba, things in Cuba, nobody's starving in Cuba, everybody has healthcare, everybody has school, everybody has housing, but the propaganda, you believe it, that if, if, if you become independent, you will be like Cuba or whatever. So these are, these, these are things that we have to consider. If you have a friend who's in a domestic violence situation and the husband makes enough money and keeps her living in a wonderful house, she can hide the bruises. And that's oh. what we're doing. Oh, I like that. that is what's that's, happening. That's, Okay, so if you have the, the right matching foundation and you can layer it, put the green over so you can match the, the, the you know, the color so you can kind of mix it, it'll blend real good. Look at the Kim Kardashian video and how she just contours her face and that's what we've been doing for a long time. We've been contouring, we've been covering it up. We have the nice little, you know, foundation. Yeah, you know, you know um, <laughs> and, and, and really, it's, just, it, it's amazing to me what, what we're able to do when we live underneath the veil. And Puerto Rico on the island, you're living underneath the veil. There's a veil, and it's this opaque veil that you can't see through. And those of us who were born outside and look towards Puerto Rico as a sense of, a font of identity, a font of, of, of culture. And then when we visit and we see Walgreens, Walmart, McDonald's, and why the hell did I come here? Mm -hmm. I hardly see any Puerto Rican anything. Oh. Wow, one, one place to go. And, and it's like the Mofongo house or something like that. And it's a, a McDonald's vacation of Puerto Rican <laughs> So I, it's, when, you have, when you have a toxic relationship, that person doesn't automatically show their cards. It's something they do over time. And what you hinted at and touched upon, why don't you rise up? Um, have a long history of violence and intimidation yeah. and assassinations of our leaders on the island. Call it what it is. Um, so arresting someone who had a pizza and a Coca-Cola wasn't an accident. There's intimidation, there's police violence. Go look it up. We have plenty of people who are martyrs to the cause. And so a lot of people are afraid to stand up because of that. We also have a long history of informing on each other 
Okay, so quítate tú para ponerme yo. I'll take you out so I can go up ahead. And we don't have the unity that we should have. The reality check that a lot of us should have gotten after, after Maria is lost in some people who, as long as they're okay, yeah. are not caring about the others. And the alarming thing was there were pockets of people who had enough and could have shared and didn't bother going a couple of miles. And then there were the amazing people who were rebuilding their neighbors' roofs, who were going and feeding their neighbors, cooking on the ground with rocks and a big fat olla, and making sure that people were, those are the real Puerto Ricans. Those are the real people, they, 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 were, they were the ones who really said, you know what, my people, my pueblo first, and I will, I will sacrifice to make sure I take care of you. There's a lot of people who have been stung by the capitalist B, who have been infected by this idea of moving up no matter who I have to stand on or stand, jump over or crush underneath my feet. So one of, the, one of the biggest things that we can do on this side is to continue spreading the information that they may not have had. When you're isolated for six months and you don't actually know what's happening, whereas everybody on the on state side was getting all this news that people didn't get over there and it was really a problem of communication. That's one of the things that we must do to continue to keep people informed, but we also have to, on our side, agitate for our elected officials to know exactly what the situation is because out of sight, out of mind, if it's not in the news, if you're not seeing stuff, you're thinking everything is fine. And this is the illusion that Governor Rosella, because that's what he is, um, <laughs> Governor Rosella is trying to push, everything is okay, go back to school even though we close your school, everything is okay, come visit Puerto Rico, let's see if the next a uh, reggaeton person can come and make a, com yeah, make a, a commercial. Let's see who I can exploit. Look at the next person I'm gonna try to exploit to make it seem. Is we definitely produce a lot of culture from that small little island. We've had a big impact on American culture. We have to consciously push back on all of our, our institutions here in the United States. And as a UFT member, a NYSET member, an AFT member, an NEA member, as a teacher, I would like to say one of our solutions is gonna have to be telling our unions to take and put a permanent anti-colonialist plank in their, 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 whole plank, in their whole, the, the position has to be anti-colonialist. What does that mean? That means they cannot try to play this game that NDA, and NAACP was trying to play, mm -hmm. which is talking on both sides of the mouth. You cannot come into a country and force their unions to become part of their union. Right. You cannot do that and then say you're for freedom or independence or self-determination because you're having a material effect on taking away that self-determination. Yep. You cannot purposely play games behind the scenes, which is what they did with FMPR and AMPR, yep. and try to take away the teacher's ability to fight back to teach what the kids need for their communities. And we have to get rid of and we have to talk against elitist education that is destroying the ability to be self-sufficient. Being a farmer is a dignified job. Being a doctor is a dignified job. Being a truck driver, which everybody needed to get all those supplies, is a dignified job. And we're doing it over here where we want everybody to be college and career ready and we forget that everybody contributes and we, we devalue certain jobs. So one of the things we definitely need to do is push back against that, that rhetoric. Because right now, the people who were the most valued in their neighborhoods on the island were the people who knew how to do electricity. <laughs> These are people who work with their hands, the laborers. Labor was the most valuable people. I'm sorry, I, I mean, doctors and everything were important too, but real talk, who was going to lift things and build things and fix things, people who had those skills. And when you devalue those children, you start closing the vocational schools on the island, and people can't figure out how to, the special ed schools can't figure out how to take care of your own. In a survival situation, if this was like a game of survivor, or if this was, God forbid, the zombie apocalypse, you're not gonna want Julie Kelleher in her big high heel shoes. She's not gonna help you survive. Okay, you're gonna want that truck driver, you're gonna want that mechanic, you wanna want that electricity person. You want those people, and we need to start valuing them, valuing labor again, because they're the ones who help people survive, help people gather materials, and help people for that moment in time, until things improved, 
really keep their life together. Those were those people. We need to, that's one of the things we have to change, the attitude. We have to change our, our culture by having those conversations because the reality is when you close the schools that teach HVAC, that teach refrigeration, that teach all those things, you are creating not only a problem for those kids who no, no longer have a pathway, but you're creating a problem for those communities who no longer have those people with those skills. The same thing's happening in New York. Yeah. You know, you have all these little small schools with ridiculous <coughs> names that have no real majors, and the kids are not getting trades, and they're not getting certifications. So one of those things is definitely reviving the respect for labor, reviving it by putting it first for education as opportunities. Because in the real world, we need real skills. And a lot of those are immediately applicable skills. Mechanics, repairing of cars, understanding the basics of, of all those different things. And that's one way that we have to push back. Not the worst layers? Not, <laughs> Not in the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> we them. Yeah, go ahead. Um, any possibility to reveal uh, the uh, Well, I, I, yeah, I think uh, the question is, is there any possibility of rebuilding it with rebuilding the uh, electricity grid or the electrical power grid of Puerto Rico with uh, renewable energy? And I say that there is, and that effort is going on right now. But I'll say a little bit more. Uh, before I get to that point, just one little introduction. Uh, this, you know, the big crisis that we all agree, and everybody in Puerto Rico agrees, even the governor, is that there's a fiscal control board. And everybody here, we're all against it, I think. I think most of the public that is listening right now is against it. The governor is against it. The other uh, ruling party, the Popular Democratic Party, they're against it. And in fact, the fiscal control board was signed into law by the, uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, during the previous party of the Partido Popular Democratico of Governor Padilla. In any case, he didn't say anything. It's interesting. Now he's against it, but when he was the governor, he was not very, very, uh, uh, but, 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 but this whole thing about a fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico is BS. There is no fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico. There's a guy called John Perkins, uh, a fellow called, a man called John Perkins, who wrote a book about 10 or 12 years ago called, I was a hitman for the IMF, I think it was called. And there he explained how he would go to Ecuador, to Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and he would lend you money more money and more money how much money you want more money the idea is you get to the point where you can't pay back your debts and then the the imf world bank they come in and they nicely take over your your uh, telephone company your electrical companies uh, aqueduct sewer your edu your schools they mon they take over and they privatize everything and that's what they did in all of latin america basically they destroyed all these uh, agencies that were public agencies very profitable and and productive for for the governments in puerto rico Regarding energy, that's what they're doing. Uh, well, th this, this whole thing about this, uh, the fact that Puerto Rico owed $72 billion, well, you know, sure, because they did it on purpose to get you to the point where you couldn't pay it back. But not only that, uh, most of that money anyway was stolen by local port, like Mr. Dundee said a little while ago, by local Puerto Rican politicians. They pocketed most of that money through all types of corrupt stuff, and the other ones uh, were the uh, mafia on Wall Street. So in any case, now the idea is the people of Puerto Rico have to pay, and how they're going to pay? By privatizing. Now, in terms of energy, yeah. But I think that the idea of, of the United States of ruling class and Wall Street is to privatize. That is, you would have in probably uh, a new electrical grid build, uh, built as, as the way that they see it, that they want it. It may even be renewable energy. It may be. But somehow, they, they're going to work it out in such a way that the big corporations, some big corporations, is going to make money. It's not going to be something where Daniel Vila, my house in Las Piedras, is going to be self-sufficient because what they're going to do is they're going to, they're already doing it with some people. They're making it such a way that you can't do it and you have to uh, pass this, you know, uh, this, uh, this uh, bar, you have to do something that they say, they make it impossible for you to really be self-sufficient on a nationwide, on a, uh, on a national level. So they're going to do it, yeah. They may have a different system which will not use oil or whatever, but then eventually what they're going to do is they're going to do it so that in any way the big corporations are going to come out winning. So we have to figure out a way so that, yeah, it's renewable energy, but it's also a socialist system yes. where you don't have these corporations exploiting you and constantly taking over everything. Uh, I'm going to close with this last point. Uh, the brother asked a little while ago what can be done in Puerto Rico. Well, 
I started talking about this march, uh, mega march that is being planned uh, in Puerto Rico. I, again, a big contingent is going to be leaving from one corner of Puerto Rico, which, which is Mayaguez. It's going to take a week to get to San Juan on the uh, 11th of November. Another big contingent coming in from Ponce, uh, or I don't know how big it will be, but in any case, there will be a contingent from Ponce to San Juan. They're both going to converge on the 18th of November. The idea is to have a people's assembly a people's assembly congregating somewhere in San Juan, close to the, uh, the dictatorial fiscal control board, uh, and then going out and marching and creating some type of a situation where it's, it's, it's just becoming unbearable in Puerto Rico, and people are, are going to be uh, willing to mobilize and, and, and do anything that is necessary. People are seeing this situation already, and I, I, I asked uh, the listeners, uh, viewers that are watching us right now, people, everybody in this room, uh, follow what goes on in Puerto Rico regarding this March for the uh, middle of November. It may be historic. Maybe nothing will happen, but it, it may very well be the, uh, the uh, beginning point of something. May 1st was how many did 15,000 oh, oh, people 50, yeah. out in the streets. Um, I will, my sister is the head of safety for the public electrical company in Puerto Rico. And I pushed her on this again as a scientist. I'm like, dude, what are you guys doing to get renewable fuels and not continue this situation? I know they're actively having those conversations. The big thing though is we have a governor right now who wants to privatize the public electrical company because it provides the largest revenue for the island. So if you sell that off to a privatizer and they can get that money from Puerto Rico, great. Right? So um, that's been the big issue that they have white folks coming in, no offense, um, coming in and, and looking for ways to get money, again, off the backs of the folks of the island. And so it's been a little bit difficult because the first thing that they want to do is sell this public service. Um, but it can be done. Puerto Rico has one of the most incredible engineering programs in the whole country. Um, and so we do have people that are capable of bringing this back up and running. The thing is, will the government allow it? And so will they let the people rebuild the grid? Yeah, so I wanted to reemphasize the point I made early on because maybe I wasn't clear about it. Um, what the federal rules say is if the Congress gives you money to rebuild, you must rebuild what was broken. So you cannot rebuild a fossil fuel plant with solar or wind. Uh, that was the fight which we largely lost. We saw the same problem in New York because, you know, the public housing projects, you know, w took a big hit from Hurricane Sandy. And a lot of them had put their um, gas heaters on the first floor of these public housing projects and they all got knocked out. We wanted them to go back and put in, um, what do they call them, a, a geothermal, you ground know, source heat pump. ground source heat pump. We were not allowed to do that, okay? And de Blasio did not fight hard enough for it. So this is not just a problem with Puerto Rico. I mean, it was bad in Puerto Rico because some of us argued this should have been the Green New Deal for Puerto Rico. We could have created a full employment economy, and we could have solved the high electric bills. We could have done it right, and basically, you know, Congress, they allowed a little bit. We, you know, not me, but other people made enough of a noise that the, some of it was allowed. But this is going to go on every single time we have one of these massive hurricanes, is that they're not going to allow us to rebuild in a more sustainable manner. And we need to really change that you know, particular role. And it would have been so much easier in Puerto Rico. Now what we've done is basically patched together an old, inefficient electric system, which will go out again the next time a big you know, hurricane hits. And one of the other things, one of the people my wife stayed at when she was in the uh, Virgin Islands, um, wealthy guy, he had a solar system. Um, it took him almost two months to be able to get power because it wasn't a self-contained system. It put the, the stuff back into the grid, and since the grid was not functioning, um, it wasn't going to work. And, and, and actually, another guy we work with, Howie and I, on times, this guy, Josh Fox. So he was trying to get down in the Virgin Islands, and he had this idea about a 40-megawatt um, solar system, and 
you know, my wife sort of said, can you check out what are the price tags? I called the big expert at SUNY Albany and said, does it, this price seem okay to you? And he said, yeah, it's on the high end, but why would you do a utility scale solar system? Because the next hurricane is just gonna knock it out. What you wanna do is build solar systems in each individual home because that's gonna have a much more higher resiliency than this big type of system, these big capital intensive projects. And so of course, you don't wanna be fighting these rules in the middle of the emergency because obviously people are saying, I want my electricity back on as soon as possible, not I wanna reconceptualize the grid and we'll get to it a year and a half. So we need to take that fight now so the next time, you know, next month when that hurricane hits someplace so we can rebuild correctly. Myron? So, um, I just have a two-part question. One, uh, you know, you mentioned infrastructure, the roads. So I've been in Puerto Rico several times. Traveling up from Mayagua is up to Amadilla, uh, all the infrastructure since you've been there, and up through the mountains on Interstate 5 from Ponce all the way up to Arecibo. Uh, what is it like now? and um, it's tied into students, federal law in getting transport for physical challenge students, mentally challenged students. What can we do to solve this problem as we get aid for these students to get them to the schools that they need to get to, and it's a federal mandate. What can be done as a social solution? Okay, I'll repeat the question and let you guys answer. Uh, first question was, What's the infrastructure like now, particularly the roads? Uh, and the second question is, how do we get the school resources that the feds mandate that are not being provided to Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican students? So the roads are still, <laughs> they're still working on the roads. There's lots of potholes, um, and there's still cables on the ground and lampposts on the ground um, that commute from whether you're taking it from the north or from the south, from my west to the east coast, like there's just a lot of holes. And so in turn, people are very, up, they're a lot more careful about their driving. <laughs> um, in terms of schools and services, there are children this year, when children started back up and all these schools were closed and you had these consolidations occurring, um, the, the biggest hit was to the special needs students. Um, the transportation was not being provided in addition. There were no special ed teachers in the school. My, my nephew, for example, it took him a month to get back to school. He has a one-to-one -one, um, situation. He's a special needs child. And ultimately, with an organization like FMBR, La Federación de Maestros de Puerto Rico, they basically sued the Department of Education to be able to get teachers and facilities to children. But that was, again, spearheaded by La Federación de Maestros de Puerto Rico and by the independent party in Puerto Rico. Um, it wasn't something that, you know, and, and my nephew was supposed to be part of that process. Um, he had a one-to-one -one teacher who he's had for three years within the public education system. She was not named. She was not reassigned to him for this year. Um, and so she had to wait a month to be assigned, meant, which meant he wasn't in school for a month. Um, and when my sister went to file the complaint, they were told, oh, but, but the request has already been made. And it's like, but when is it going to happen? School already started. Um, and it wasn't until um, Mercedes got involved in, in suing that all of a sudden the teacher appeared. So. Suing, suing the government. <laughs> Sue the bastards. Um, okay, So the question is, is the future of the United States what we've seen in Puerto Rico? 
And I'm asking about migration. My, I have a cousin that lives in Orlando. And um, it's, it's, Orlando has gotten many Puerto Ricans in it. It's like it's little Puerto Ricans. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And uh, it seems like the island is being uh, empty out and sold to hedge fund managers that are, you know, taking these uh, big spots of land. And uh, it's almost like we're going backwards when we have. Uh, so, so there are patterns that you're picking up on. That's why you asked that question: Is the future of the U.S. <laughs> like does it, you know, mirror what's happening in Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico, for a long time, has been a petri dish, an experimental place to uh, use the people and the society to see what, how it would look. We already have an example of what happens when uh, climate change or some climate event can impact a city and then uh, privatization. Look at New Orleans. Um, we know the patterns through the shock doctrine. We know what's really the plan, the bigger plan. At Indianapolis at the Network for Public Education, we got to mix with people from all over the country. We also got to hear from uh, uh, Posse Salzberg, and who's been talking about GERM, which is a global um, education reform movement. The reality is that worldwide, um, since public education is pretty much the last thing that you can kind of take over, they already took over healthcare, right? Um, they are trying to find ways to privatize to make money. Charters are part of that. Um, in, Nor in New Zealand right now, they've pushed back and they're getting rid of charters. And so the reality is there's a lot of places who are pushing back and putting um, rules in, in uh, stopping more charters from happening, stopping taking over public buildings for charters. So in New York City, if we want to push back to stop the same pattern repeating, what we need to do is push back on our legislators to stop co-locations of charters that are privatizing. But we also need to have the conversation about the motive, the profit motive for all of this privatization. No one does that for free. No one does that out of the goodness of their heart. They have the intent of making a profit. Um, the people were talking about these charter organizations and getting mortgages for 30 years and, and getting loans when their charter from the state only lasts five years. So there's games being played and then being able to purchase a, a building that was, that was funded by public funds and taking it away from the public. It's already been appointed, fixed, and whatever, and now they, now they own a private you know, now, now, now it's private, a public school is building. So the real estate game, we need to be aware <coughs> that that's the end game. Um, the, you're noticing that this is happening. Many, many cities around the country have had that whole thing of this game of, we call it different things, gentrification. Mm -hmm. But uh, the patterns are very real. It's the push out and displacement, temporary or semi-permanent, so that there can be an exchange of, of goods and real estate and that you can let some people still live in those neighborhoods, but you've fully taken over all the institutions that are there. This has repeated itself in every big city that has had an invasion of charters that are now creating this competition, a false competition, and suck the money dry from the public schools. That's what's happening in Puerto Rico, where these schools now are overcrowded, buildings are closed, they're selling it to religious institutions for a dollar. So us as taxpayers, we need to question any program that doesn't benefit us with the tax money. Any organization getting something that was publicly funded and now trade, now getting that property. Anything that is public property that we have paid for, we had to push back from. So what happened in New Orleans, all of the schools became charters overnight. And all of those teachers were pushed out overnight. And the majority of the kids didn't return overnight. So similar things are happening in Houston. Obviously, you know, uh, wherever uh, uh, wherever disaster hits, you'll see people like vultures with opportunities. And it's it's a bigger idea. It's not just in America. It's worldwide. It's happened in multiple places, and they'll give it different names. But essentially, it's the same thing. We used to have public hospitals. Now we don't, right? We used to have all of this the stuff that we before the privatization of healthcare. Look, they're doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing with education. In the Bronx in particular, uh, if you look at all of the labels that they give schools, right? And every few years they'll give a new label. Oh, this is a receivership school. Oh, this is a renewal school. Now we're gonna have the Bronx plan and we're gonna target blah, blah, blah. 
And what they really are doing is finding ways to displace people who have the institutional memory so that people will be so frightened and stressed out and parents will get letters and run away so that they can eventually take over the building. That's the end goal. All of these schools that are being closed, that are being, people are being pushed out, it is not an accident and it's not a, it, a coincidence that there are condos being built within walking distance of these schools to be closed. Because these schools are going to be closed on purpose so that they can wipe the slate clean so that any local schools attached to the new development will no longer have a long track record, will no longer have a bad track record, and they will send all these kids letters to their parents, you're going to a bad school, you have the right to leave, to purposely push those kids out. That pushes parents out, because parents can't go to three different schools with three different kids and run around, so it's a way of depopulating and creating this false scarcity, creating this false panic, because they have every intent to take over a neighborhood. And, and as socialists and as people who are inv invested in the, in the health of our, of, our, <laughs> of our earth, a lot of us do volunteer work in parks, and we do a lot of stuff where we try to rebuild and beautify our neighborhoods. And it's probably gonna be a painful thing to recognize that when you do that, there are real estate interests around letting you do that work and having every intent of benefiting from that. So a lot of times when you hear that a park is being renewed, what you need to know is where did that funding come from magically? Who was that person who allowed that funding to come, like St. Mary's? And who's backing that person? So if you have someone who has hedge fund and real estate interest funding their campaign and they somehow let money go to fix a park, and one stop away is luxury lofts, the other stop is, is condos, it also makes sense that she's not gonna fight schools closing in her neighborhood. You know who I'm talking about, I'm not gonna even say the name, tell me I can figure it out. Yeah, say the name, no. She's no longer employed anymore. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that. She lost her job. But real talk, that's it. It's all a real estate game, and you gotta pay attention, open your eyes to see who is in the city, okay, who at the state level, who is funding them, and how they seem to be taking, oh, this, oh, it's great, we're fixing this, we're improving the neighborhood, but for who? For the people who are currently living there, or the people you hope are gonna live there sometime soon? If you're going to fix the hub, 149th, you're gonna purposely leave Roberto Clemente Square for like, do you say, cuanto año is not fixed? while you're waiting for the K2 crisis to finish, and now you're also doing all this stuff to fix that area so it can now be a nice shopping area, right? With the Opera House Hotel and all this nice gentrification, that whole area. Well, not surprising, Bernie Sanders came and spoke at St. Mary's Park. Okay, so put all the dots together. Schools, pushing people out of neighborhoods, edge of gentrification, real estate, and the game is, that's the game. Privatization. Yeah, basically, real, real quickly, um, <clears throat> in, in terms of what they're doing, I don't think it's that the United States is going to be looking like Puerto Rico, but rather it's, it's what, you know, there's this place called Detroit, which incidentally I hope to visit before Christmas. Detroit, once upon a time, was the, the center, like the, 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 the leadership, the vanguard of the working class in the United States. You had all these auto, uh, uh, auto uh, manufacturers and many other factories, and uh, the unions there, the workers, they were militant. They were given the example and the vanguard, literally, to, to everybody else in, in the country. Well, that was one of the main, main parts. But what did they do? They destroyed the Detroit through the same, same system they're, they're doing in Puerto Rico. But and through it, the schools too. Through the school laws, but that's what I mean. Basically, they drive you to bankruptcy. So it's a it's a gigantic plan to gentrify Puerto Rico. I've spoken with many, 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 many people uh, in Puerto Rico. Everybody feels the same, regardless of whether they're in favor of independence or not. And uh, I've been there twice this year, and everybody f sees it. Everybody sees it. It's just that people aren't able to to move. And I think that we should reconsider what we uh, said as, as one of our, our topics here. How do we get there? The problem in Puerto Rico is that what we have typically seen uh, historically as the leaders of, of the mass movement in Puerto Rico, the labor movement, is right now very bureaucratized. You have basically three tendencies in labor. You have a more militant uh, socialist uh, tendency, you have middle of the rotors, and then you have the United States unions, which have gone there. 
destroyed the Puerto Rican unions, they've taken them over, they've colonized them, which is what she was talking about before a little while ago, that uh, workers here have to, one of the very concrete things is take uh, steps and make sure that our unions here, our labor movement, does not colonize uh, labor movements in other countries, because it's not just in Puerto Rico, they're doing it in Mexico and many, many other parts. The problem is, how do people mobilize, and in my opinion, only a mass movement coming from the masses at this point. It's not going to be, uh, unfortunately, the labor movement. It's not even going to be the so-called independence, traditional independence movement. I was a member and I was a, a regional director of, for, for a short while, a member of the Central Committee of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party in Puerto Rico. That organization has pretty much fizzled down to just a, a couple of, uh, a few hundred members. The organizations that were historically the very militant leaders and so on have also disappeared. It has to be something new that has to come from the people, and I believe it is in the process of coming. But what's going to have to happen is we old timers of the generation of the 1960s and 70s probably will have to die, get out of the way like the dinosaurs, and maybe uh, younger people with uh, a fresh vision of how to do things. I think one of the problems we need that to we have. Pass the torch, but y'all need to no, no, no. We don't have we don't have to pass no torch. The torch has to be uh, taken away from. Uh, oh. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't pass a torch to nobody. <laughs> I'm going to hold that torch until I die. You know, that's the way it works. A new generation, uh, 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 dynamic, militant group of people, workers mostly led by, but also university people. Right now, there was an assembly. Again, uh, this was not talked about a little while ago, but there was a, a massive uh, uh, assembly of students at the University of Puerto Rico a few days ago. They're all mobilizing for this activity that I'm talking to you about the, this March. Hopefully, out of that, you're going to have new leadership. And also, the unions, these bureaucrats, even these good socialist leaders that I, I know them all in Puerto Rico, they got to get out of the way because they ain't doing nothing. And yeah, the, the workers got to take them out of the way, literally. And new people have to come. And I'm sure that people will do it because there's, there's, there's no country in the, in the world where people are suicidal and it's gotten to that point in Puerto Rico. Yes. <laughs> They don't necessarily play the Democratic Republican game nearly as much as this. And I live across the street from St. Mary's Park, and I walked out my door, and all of a sudden I see the Bernie Sanders thing. I had no notice he was going to be there, and I'm like, what the? F I'll say, it, what the fuck is going on? And so they told me Bernie Sanders, Secret Service, you have to do this, and I see all these people there, not one person from the neighborhood. Oh, really? And I walked around horrible. the neighborhood. I, I, I asked him, I said, uh, you know what's going on in snow? Do you know who Bernie Sanders is? No. no. Blah, blah, blah. I asked like 20 people. And I said, this is a bunch of bullshit. I already did like Bernie, but that didn't help. What a bunch of garbage that whole thing was. And those Bernie bros that came over and told us what to do, Man, they could learn more from us. Well, I'm still waiting to learn something from them. They haven't taught us anything. Uh -huh. Now, on a specific subject of Puerto Rico, um, two things, and this is, I'm, I'm sure all of you can answer, but I know Daniel really well on this. Um, what's like the international support like throughout Latin America for the Puerto Rican struggles? Like as like Maduro chipped in and giving money also with the notion that both Daniel and I are mixed up with a lot of radical youth of today. And they're still fighting the sectarian battle that grandfathers fought, which is really a shame. You know, the best ones are admiring really sectarian ideology. But so what's back to what's a international support? Like is Maduro or um, even when Zelaya was there in Honduras, did he try to help? Or what about like uh, you know, the new guy in Mexico, I mean, he's a rat, but what's going on? I mean, okay, so, so the question for the audience watching is, uh, what kind of international support, particularly from Latin America, is there for Puerto Rico? Very, very quickly. 100%. The problem is not international support. The United Nations has over and over and over again, just the way, yeah supports all the revolutions against uh, colonialism in Puerto Rico, just like it has condemned Israel also uh, in Puerto Rico. The problem is it's not a matter of solidarity, and this is one of the things that, that, that in a way uh, sometimes really concerns me, because we on the left, 
Uh, and part of the left in Puerto Rico is constant, constantly focusing on this need to get international support. We have it. The problem is our own people, I, I swear, to, you know, that, that's the problem. We do not mobilize, we do not do, what, for example, those uh, thousands of people walking from Honduras, I think that's a nutty thing. I don't think it makes sense because I think that eventually they're going to be very frustrated. The children have suffered for those kids more than anything else. But, but on the other hand, I have to admire their determination, their courage to walk. And, and they're going to go to that wall. Hopefully, they'll get through into the United States because of some type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, humanitarian reason. Uh, but if they don't, this has been a great lesson for all of Latin America mm. as to what that does. So let's see what happens. That and we're still exposes. Yeah, well, exposes, but also teaches people people that you have to organize in your own country and the many of the people that are marching were Celaya supporters that you mentioned the elections there uh, the president is called Juan Hernandez he stole the elections he stole the elections with the support of the US and it's the second coup d'etat they do in, in, in that country in about 10 years uh, but in any case the people of Puerto Rico we have to do something similar we have to rebel we have to organize and we have to say it openly we have we cannot be afraid of saying we must rebel against this this uh, repressive imperialist government and, and it's not going to be done through electoral politics because I have taken part in that many times in Puerto Rico. I voted for the uh, Socialist Party and, and was a candidate there also once. I voted for the Independence Party or, or whatever uh, pro, uh, you know, pro independence person there is. The problem is you need a people's revolution in Puerto Rico. It's not going to be done any other way. And when that starts happening, I'm sure that we here also will give solidarity to a concrete movement. Right now, there's not too much we could do in terms of solidarity, but I think we're doing as much as we can, at least with conferences like this, which are very good in terms of getting the, the information out. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I just wanted to make a comment that I think many times with those kind of movements in Honduras, the country has, you have to hit rock bottom. Yeah. And the same thing with the United States, people think, oh, there's going to be mass movements and all that. It's not going to happen until things hit rock bottom and then people, you know, wake up. Absolutely. Right now, half of the country, I would say, is, is, uh, is asleep of what's really going on behind the scenes. You know, so the they're um, brainwashed with it's on television and, uh, and you know, on the radio, and uh, they, um, they're they not aware of what, what they're, you know, they're being cheated. Um, generational fear the, and yeah. intimidation that has happened where people just tell, oh, you don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, among family, you don't talk about that. Yeah. Or, and you get oppressed, your questions don't get asked, and you kind of live underneath the veil. Well, I, I, was, I mean, for me, for example, my family, my mother, she said she was told me, don't ever get involved in politics. And, you know, be careful. This the first thing she said, this be careful. Right? Be careful. And, uh, and that's a shame, but that's how many Americans feel. Mm -hmm. Well, the comment was suggested that we won't get moving in this country till we hit rock bottom. And I'm going to take issue with that. Um, I think people move when they have hope, when they sense their power. The reason people aren't moving is not because they're not hurting enough, it's because they feel powerless. And that's, you know, I've had this conversation on doorsteps. I live in Syracuse, very poor city, most concentrated black and Latino poverty of any metro in the country fifth most concentrated white poverty, which tells you the segregation and discrimination is class bias as well as racial. And you talk to people and they say, oh no, I'm not going to get caught in that game. Neither party cares about me. The politicians don't know me. They don't know my problems. I'm not going to be a sucker. I'm not getting caught up in their game. And what I try to tell them is, you just got caught up in it because they don't want you to vote so they don't have to pay attention to you. And that to me is when expectations are rising, then people can go for more. You know, the, the militancy of the 60s was built upon victories in the civil rights movement. And out of that came the women's movement, the environmental movement, the gay liberation movement. You know, the black freedom movement set an example and everybody said, well, I got issues too. And they showed me, they showed me how to fight. And then what happened? Uh, what killed the movement? I think it was the recession, right? The last month of 73, right into 74 and 75. And I was both working in construction and going to school. And we lost jobs in construction and the students got scared. And the parents were telling them, 
stop demonstrating and you know you better get your degree and get a job because hard times are coming so that's that's another way of looking at it I don't think it has to get worse if we wait for it to get worse then it's also telling us well there's nothing we can do about it I think you know we we got to build little victories and build upon that and, and gives a sense of momentum and a sense of our own power because in the end there are more of us than there are them and we really have the power if we rise up and take it so anyway that's my comment well listen we're getting toward nine o'clock and unless somebody's got a burning question or comment uh, I would suggest that we uh, call this to an end we can talk informally and I really want to thank the panel I learned a lot and uh, I have some questions I want to ask them just follow up as well so thanks everybody for coming Thank you, Howard. Well, thank you. I keep getting younger. I got to see you every four years. <laughs> I don't know.